Well, I'm, I'm almost a Nebraskan because I grew up mostly in Maryville, Missouri, which is only two hours drive from Omaha. And I was born in a small town in North Dakota and lived almost my whole life in the Plains states. Uh, but I've only lived in Nebraska for six years. Um, moved to Omaha from South Dakota six years ago and went to the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. So I've kind of lived in almost the entire upper Midwest at one time or another, but I live in Omaha now and I really love it there. Well, I went to Northwest Missouri State University and after that I went to the University of Iowa to study poetry writing and um, got an MFA in poetry writing and my teachers there were Marvin Bell and Marcia Southwick who used to teach here after she left Iowa. And um, Larry Levis and uh, Gerald Stern were some of my poetry teachers in graduate school. And um, my, uh, my undergraduate teachers included William Trowbridge, who's actually from Omaha and uh, writes some really great poetry. Well, I, uh, I've always written poems that have to do with prairie subjects. And in fact, uh, when, I, when I was living in Missouri, I actually set a poem in Nebraska at a place that I've never been to before. Um, I wrote a poem. I, um, I was writing a series of poems that include interesting things in alphabetical order. Uh, so it's kind of, it's n no wonder that I write children's books because even in my adult poems, I was including lists of things in alphabetical order. And uh, I loved uh, prairie and prairie grasses and, and so forth. And so I had this idea that I would write a poem about the prairie and it would have at grasses from A to Z throughout the poem. And so I did a, a bunch of research to find out um, what types of grasses grew in what parts. And I wanted to especially include uh, prairie grasses because it was about a, a, a kid growing up in the rural prairie. And, uh, but I, I wanted to include grasses from A to Z and so I had to look at maps of like the range of big blue stem versus some other types of prairie grass. And um, I, I triangulated all these different types of grass and I found that um, Windside, Nebraska was the area where, the, they, where they all would meet and they could all uh, possibly all coexist. And so even though I lived in Maryville, Missouri and I was really visualizing uh, the grass outside of Maryville, which is really only an hour from Nebraska, mm -hmm. I, I, I put Windside into the poem so that it would make uh, um, sense. And I'm familiar with that. I mean, I grew up in Maryville, but I was born in North Dakota. So I've driven down I-29 my whole life visiting relatives. So it's, it made perfect sense because I was from North Dakota as well as from Missouri in my history. And I, I managed to have uh, grasses from A to Z in a poem that I hope make, makes narrative sense. Can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I've always written about prairie subjects and I, I wrote a long poem about uh, growing up in Maryville and I wrote a poem set in the North Dakota Badlands based on a story that my grandfather told me. Mm -hmm. So I've always written about prairie subjects and as for my children's books, um, the, the ones that I've had published don't have anything to do with that, but I have written children's books that are s so far unpublished mm -hmm. that are set in prairie locales. When I was a child, I, um, I was already interested in like the old people and their stories and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so uh, even when I was not writing for children, I was often writing poems about uh, old people in Maryville, and um, so there was a, a lady that my brother's girlfriend um, helped. She she lived with and helped her helped her out in her personal needs and so forth. And uh, and so I went and talked to her a lot and talked to a lot of old people in town and um, and books that I read. I read children's books like Henry Huggins that were about small town life, and um, but I also enjoyed. Um, wild stories like the Phantom Tollbooth and um, uh, so people people in my childhood would have included those uh, elderly people including my grandfather mm -hmm. and uh, and books would inc would include both things about small town life and exotic adventures and 
and then, well, uh, sometime around graduate school, uh, or not graduate school, but sometime in college, I decided to write for adults. And, um, and my poetry uh, was probably influenced by a t totally different group of people, even though I was still writing about, say, the old people in Maryville, uh, where I grew up. Um, well, uh, Marvin Bell was my teacher at the University of Iowa, and my writing is nothing at all like his, but there's something about his attitude and, of course, his teaching that uh, influenced me. And um, so they're, they're, I'm, I'm 46 now, and I've, I, I've written everything from picture books to um, poetry for adults to uh, I'm writing a young adult novel, and I write... I write so many different things now that uh, I can't even trace a lot of my influences, probably. Well, I decided and knew that I wanted to be a writer in third grade. And uh, part of my uh, reason that I write for children is probably that I remember my childhood uh, very well. And I already knew then that I was going to be uh, a writer. And it wasn't like I. Uh, even thought about it, it was more like I read these books and I thought, wow, that's great, and I want to do that too. And so I, st I started writing, and I also started saving everything that I wrote in third grade. So I still have my third grade books that I wrote, and um, childhood poems, and uh, I guess I'm still, I still have a lot of the same interests as I did then, because I I tracked down this old fiddler in northern Minnesota to record his tunes before they were lost. So I'm still going out and interviewing old people and still uh, hanging out, even though I lived in St. Louis for a while, which is kind of a little bit off of prairie territory. I'm still kind of in the same territory that I, I grew up in. And uh, when I do school visits, I always show, uh, show the kids books that I wrote as a, as a child. So I... I even have them with me right here. Uh, Adventure in the Cave, Joe and Lewis, book two, and The Bomb and the Pink Teddy Bear. <laughs> those, those were two books that I wrote in sixth grade. And uh, kids really enjoy um, seeing my childhood books and seeing the mistakes in them and seeing that I, I didn't always um, write successfully, you might say. But they also enjoy the, the stories. And, and so I think there is something. Um, that has universal appeal in those stories, even, even if kids enjoy seeing that I spelled things wrong and so forth. <laughs> it was like an unquestioning thing that I just loved reading so much that I just knew I was going to write. And I have way too many ideas to ever put on paper. Mm -hmm. So I probably select, of all the r ideas that I have to write, I probably select one out of 30, maybe, to actually put on paper, because um, there just isn't enough time uh, to write all the things that I want to write. Um, well, I'm writing a young, young adult novel set in 13th century Norway, and it seems that right now I gravitate toward um, stories uh, combining um, kind of local realism and local color with uh, some uh, exotic imaginative uh, world. And, um, and I'm I'm more and more interested in Norway as a setting. I, I never was planning on writing books set in Norway in the 13th century, but somehow it, my life experiences have brought me in the direction that uh, I got ideas for these uh, books set in Norway and these characters. And I, I started writing and found the characters interesting. And um, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, it's all a process because it, it started with going to Norway in 1992 with no plan of looking for material. And then my uh, relatives that I was visiting showed me this old church uh, on their island and gave me a book about it. And I started reading about this old church. And I thought, wow, that would be a great uh, kind of springboard for a, a book. And so I started writing it, but not knowing what was going to happen in it. And then the characters seemed interesting. And, uh, and I had the idea that the whole novel would be set in the dark, because it's above the Arctic Circle in winter. So I, 
I, I moved the island of several hundred miles north of where it really was. <laughs> and so, uh, and then I did research and found more and more about 13th century Norway. And, uh, and so it just, um, well, and then it leads to more things. As I do more research on that subject, I get more ideas. And so it's just an idea that led to, to bigger and more things. But I also am writing um, uh, just uh, picture books that aren't involved with Norway at all either. I've always got more than one project going at a time. Um, I, I just try to write whenever I can. And uh, it tends to be late at night, but I don't, um, I don't say to myself, boy, it's, it's morning and I don't, I, I, I don't write till 10 at night. Uh, I guess I better wait or anything okay. like that. So it tends to be nighttime, but it can be morning or some other time if, I, if that's what's uh, available in the day. It's definitely changed over the years. I, uh, when I first uh, decided to write in my early poetry from maybe when I was 20, 22 years old, I wrote about local life in a very straightforward style. And um, at some point, I decided to combine that with more outlandish language and more imaginative uh, approaches to it. And so uh, that, I think that's true of my poetry for adults and my writing for children. It, um, uh, it, when I write for children, for example, I, I don't say to myself, hmm, child's vocabulary. I'm not going to use a big word here. I, I really hardly think about the fact that I'm writing for children. And it might be because I have a child's tastes myself that I just put in there what I think is interesting. And I just imagine that there's a child that's going to find it to be interesting, too. So um, like Santa's Secrets Revealed, uh, it's about Santa Claus and how he can get around the world in one night and so forth. Um, it's probably the only children's picture book that has um, a kind of a, a page based on the theory of relativity. <laughs> So I just thought it would be funny to uh, include uh, some physics and, and mathematics in a, in a book about Santa Claus, and kids seem to love it. I go, go to schools all the time and talk about my writing and show them my books. And that's how it, yeah. And so I, I, and when I wrote It's Disgusting and We Ate It, my book about foods around the world, I just put the foods in there that I thought were most interesting and the, and the facts about foods. Mm -hmm that were most interesting. I was not imagining third graders uh, as I wrote the book. I just interviewed people, read books, went on wild searches for the craziest food that I could, and, and put it in the book. I, I have to say that I, just, I, I write things that I think are interesting, and I just assume that somebody else will find them interesting, too. There's, uh, I guess I just believe in universal humanity, and I feel like I, if I write it and I'm interested in it, or if I'm blown away by some like, fact about food around the world, or I find through my research some really interesting thing to write about in Norway, for example, in this old church that nobody has thought about much, um, I just, if I'm blown away by it and I think that's a great subject, then I just assume that somebody else will find that to be a great subject too. Well, of course, uh, everybody probably knows that it's uh, ridiculously difficult to get uh, books published. and. Uh, and because of that, I think that it's, uh, it's not a good idea to try to guess what editors want. Or I, I don't think it's good to say, gee, I really wanted to write this, but instead I'm going to write this other thing because I think it'll be popular. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think that people trying to be popular becomes transparently uh, trying to be popular. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have the substance or the heart or something like that. So I actually think that I, I, I try to write the things that I think are interesting. And a lot of the stuff, frankly, doesn't get published. And, uh, but some of it does. And so that's the way I try to overcome the huge odds against ever getting anything published. It's just. Um, uh, Try to write the most interesting things that you can, and and try to keep learning, and 
be open to critique and, and constantly revising. And you know, if you see that you uh, if you come back to your work, that you, something you wrote a year ago, and you see things to, to do to it, be open to keeping uh, keeping on uh, revising and writing. And eventually, you still might not get it published because <laughs> that's the reality of the publishing world. But you'll have written something that you'll be really glad that you wrote. Actually, I have lists of, of ideas that I want to work on, and um, uh, I'm so busy just trying to get through the ones, uh, get the ones that I'm working on finished that I, I can't say that I have, I even know what I'm going to work on after I finish those. I just, because uh, I'm working on a, a novel, I'm, I'm kind of, I've actually written both of these novels that I'm talking about, but I'm putting some final touches on revising, one for probably fifth graders and one for teenagers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I say I'm putting finishing touches on, I mean finished to show to editors, not finished, mm -hmm. because the writing process is still enormous after an editor gets a hold of it. For both of my books, mm -hmm. uh, I sent in books that I was really proud of, but only 10% of each book remains. I'd say 90% of these books came about after I got suggestions from the editors. They, they actually, the editors for both my books uh, had ideas for completely, um, they had a different vision for the book than what I had actually sent to them. Mm -hmm. And some people might be distressed by getting an editor to say, well, this is a really interesting book, but I have a different vision for it than, you, than yours. <laughs> but in, in both of these cases, their visions were so fantastic that um, I went with them. And I'm so glad that I did, because I feel that the books are 10 times as good. And not much remains of the original thing that I sent, but I'm, I'm fine with that if it results in a fantastic what I feel is a very successful book. Well, good evening. Thanks for coming to the Heritage Room this evening. Uh, my name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator here of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the room and also to the John H. Ames Reading Series. This series has been in existence for about 20 years, I discovered earlier this year. Um, in fact, the first the very first Ames Readings um, program was this one that happened on June 20th in 1985, and it was Catherine Kidwell. And we do have a videotape in case you want to watch this program, the very first Ames. And then prior to the Ames Reading series, there was another series called um, Poetry and Fiction Reading. And this one happened, started about a year before that, and this was Don Welch. Some of you may have heard of him. He's been around for quite a while and done a lot of readings. Um, he also is introduced by a fairly famous person, um, a poet um, that we're all hearing about these days, and it actually is, is Ted Couser, who introduced him. He looks a little bit different. He has a little more hair and he has a beard, but if you want to see that one, you can check these out too. Um, I was just going to say we've gotten a little more high tech now, and we're doing the DVDs instead of the videos. So. This is um, Timothy Shofford, who read for us a couple of years ago. So if you'd rather have that format, you can do those too. Um, the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room is a special collection. Um, we have about 12,000 volumes now by about 3,000 Nebraska authors. And the idea is to preserve and promote works by Nebraska authors. You're more than welcome to join us during our regular public service hours, which are somewhat limited. Um, we're open on um, Tuesday through Friday afternoons from 12 to 3, which cuts out school children quite a bit, I realize. But we're also open on Sunday afternoons, so we do see some, some younger school people at that time, too. So um, We'd also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, because they, um, through an endowment, through their volunteer efforts, are to help us to fund programs like these. Tonight our reader is James Solheim. He's an Omaha resident and he's lived there since 1999, if I read my information correctly. Um, he's also lived in North Dakota, South Dakota. He's also lived in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana. He must be like states with eyes in him, I don't know. 
and in Missouri. He's a graduate of Northwest Missouri State University, and he has an MFA from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. His work has appeared in many literary magazines, uh, for example, the Missouri Review, the Poetry, Nor Poetry Northwest, and the Kenyon Review, just to name a few. He's also won several prizes, the Blue Ribbon Book of the Center for Children's Books, and the Pushcart Prize, to name a few. He's especially interested in the long poem, and he also has written several children's books with long titles. So he must like <laughs> long poems and long titles. Um, one of them is called It's Disgusting and We Ate It, True Food Facts from Around the World and Throughout History. And the other one is called Santa's Secrets Revealed. All your questions answered about Santa's super sleigh, his flying reindeer, and other wonders. We're happy to have James Solheim with us here. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. I must be a long-winded guy because uh, it's true. My, my books have long titles, and they have lots of words on every page, and uh, but people talking in word balloons, and this book of unusual foods from around the world and throughout history has charts in it about um, how much protein there is in bugs and spiders. Um, it has a page called Ancient Foods We Could Still Eat If We Dared. And uh, so I just... Uh, go wild when I write a book, and I just keep thinking of more and more crazy things to put in. This is one of my favorite pages that I've ever come up with, and uh, it goes back to my childhood. I, I, I'm still a child at heart, I think, and I, maybe that's why I went back to writing children's books, or maybe I'm regressing, because 20 years ago I was writing for adults, and now I'm writing for third graders. <laughs> but uh, this, this page, Ancient Foods We Could Still Eat If We Dared, when I was writing this book, uh, It's Disgusting and We Ate It, it's about foods f around the world and throughout history. I wanted to have foods that go back thousands of years, and I wanted foods from every continent, including Antarctica. And uh, so I thought about my fourth grade friend, Chris Burnett, and how he told me that they'd found woolly mammoths frozen in Siberia. And I thought, if that's true, I want to put woolly mammoths in here as a food that a living person could eat. <laughs> because I thought, they found, he told me that they found them and their, their meat was still red and looked fresh, just like frozen hamburger, except it was 41,000 years old, but sometimes I forget something in my freezer and <laughs> gets a little freezer burn, <laughs> scrape it off, and it's still okay. So, uh, but I didn't actually know if this fourth grade friend of mine was telling the truth. So I started doing research, and uh, after checking through a pile of books, I found uh, this book by Dr. Otto F. Hertz uh, and his uh, experiences in Siberia from October 17, 1901. And uh, I put it in my book uh, under the title, T Scientists Tempted to Eat 40,000-Year-Old Mammoth. And uh, this was 1901, and I thought, if it happened in 1901, there, there probably are other woolly mammoths out there. And so I kept doing research. And I found um, a scientist at the University of Alaska who worked on a uh, uh, prehistoric bison that they found in Alaska. And her um, information about this bison was in the University of Alaska website. And I just called her up and I said, hi, I'm writing a children's, books about, children's book about unusual foods. Um, I'd like to know if you know of anybody living who has eaten woolly mammoth meat. And she said, no, but I've eaten 36,000-year-old uh, bison meat. <laughs> she said that when they <laughs> dug this bison out of the glacier in Alaska, they uh, looked at that bright red, fresh-looking meat, and they said, we got to try it. <laughs> and so she and her friends made bison stew with 36,000-year-old bison meat. And she told me it tasted like mud. But she survived. I, I mean, I don't think I would have done it, because I would have thought, you know, prehistoric bacteria were probably highly toxic to a modern 
person, and who knows what's in there, but uh, she was a scientist. And that's, that's really what inspired me to, uh, to even take that route. I thought, scientists are wacky people. There's got to be somebody that has been tempted to eat prehistoric meat, and sure enough, there was. So I have a, a full uh, nutritious meal here of 36,000-year-old bison meat, 8,500-year-old corn and squash seeds from the Anasazi uh, ruins, or not from the Anasazi ruins, but in the general area where the Anasazi were from. Um, I have 2,000-year-old popcorn buried in Bat Cave, New Mexico, and it still popped. <laughs> and 200-year-old uh, wine, once owned by Thomas Jefferson. So all these, not all prehistoric, but all these historic things and prehistoric things uh, made it into the book, and it, go, it really goes back to my fourth grade friend telling me that, that they found woolly mammoths frozen in Alaska. So I actually knew that I wanted to be a writer when I was in third grade. That's how, uh, that's how I became a writer. In third grade, I just loved to read so much that I started writing books, and I just knew it, and uh, it was not a realistic view uh, at that point because I had no idea how hard it was to get books published. I kind of just thought, you write a bunch of books and you have great ideas and then somebody will publish them and that's your job. And I found out it's a lot harder than that. Um, but I was, I was publishing my own books in third grade. Here's The Bomb and the Pink Teddy Bear, book one of the Joe and Lewis series, and then here's Adventure in the Cave, book two of the Joe and Lewis series. And uh, so I wrote these uh, adventure stories and um, kind of, uh, they were, you know, I thought of them as serious, but when I go back and read them, I was, <laughs> they weren't serious. I just could not resist having the characters doing wacky things and, <laughs> and uh, saying crazy things and uh, having outlandish things happen to them. So I've always, since childhood, combined kind of everyday things with humor and outlandish things. Uh, let me read, um, I'll read a story to you that I wrote in fifth grade. Here it is. It's called The Cold Day, and it's about Joe and Lewis. I had these two characters, Joe and Lewis, that I always wrote about in uh, third through sixth grade, I'd say, or maybe, maybe seventh grade. So here's The Cold Day, starring Joe and Lewis. Listen, whispered Joe. Why, Lewis replied. Just listen. I know what it is, exclaimed Lewis. It's the wind. Right, Joe said. Let's watch the thermometer go down. 49 degrees. Wow, look at it now, Joe exclaimed. It's going down fast. 42, 37. We better get on something warmer, Lewis said. It will probably be 10 degrees when we get back. They got on warmer coats and came back. Wow, it's lower than we expected. Two degrees below zero, Lewis exclaimed. <laughs> Let's make a snowman, Joe said. Good idea. They were soon making a snowman. Joe, look at the thermometer, 19 below. Soon they were done making the snowman. I think we better go in, Joe told Lewis. It's 50 below. You're right. The boys went in. They played checkers and went out and saw that it was now 61 degrees below zero. I wish it was 61 degrees above zero. Then we could go out and play football, Lewis told Joe. I'm going outside to tell the wind to be 61 degrees above zero, Joe said to Lewis. Wind, be 61 degrees above zero. Then it was 61 degrees above zero, and it was 61 degrees above zero, happily ever after. <laughs> Uh, I love reading my uh, my childhood writings because they're so influenced by books for children at the time. Like the the characters in my book are constantly exclaiming instead of like Joe said, it's Joe exclaimed, and then uh, or Joe retorted. Um, retorted is one of those books that you would always see in in children's books of say 1950s, 1960s, and nowadays they believe in a more toned down style, and it's always like Joe said. But you go back to uh, uh, something from the 50s or 60s, and it, it'll, they're retorting and exclaiming a lot more than they, <laughs> they are in modern children's books. So, so that, was, that was what I thought I was going to be writing when I uh, 
when I grew up, stories like that. But when I got to um, be in college, I started writing poetry uh, that was, um, it was supposedly serious, I guess, but it didn't quite, somehow I, I just couldn't take reality and, and just write about it, so I had to give it some unusual uh, perspective. So here's a poem that I wrote about uh, the small town that I grew up in, Maryville, Missouri. Um, and it kind of comes out of another thing that I did in childhood. I liked to go out to a rock quarry near Maryville and look for fossils. And so I got the idea that there are these fossils under Maryville. And like when everybody's asleep, it's a small town, so I imagined that there would be a time in Maryville, unlike a larger place where there would, there's always somebody awake, I imagined there would be a time in Maryville when everybody's asleep and then the fossils underneath Maryville can come to life and, and then we would see what happened. So here's my book called Cambrian, my book, this is my poem called Cambrian Night. It's a, a poem I wrote probably when I was 30 years old, I guess. At 3 a.m., the first trilobites swim out over the reefs of Chevy's on 3rd Street out across the abandoned sidewalk and through the window of Mrs. Gray. Out they come, down the alley and through the back of the volleyball court, through the shirts and underwear someone forgot to bring in from the clothesline. Out they come through the professional airbrush van, through the mirror and the letters and the pink kiss decal. Uninventing legs, unremembering us in the century where we fell asleep, the crinoids break from the fossil stone, push up through the dirt and concrete and dressers and beds, and main creaks open for the primitive sponge. A pizza place tilts, sign conceding its letters to salt. Bryozoan and arachnid twine around the televisions we fell asleep to, and the water crusts our rooms with brachiopods as it seeps into the all-night station's broadcast, sent from a distant city where someone is still awake, the picture sizzling into dark. Algae parts for first light. Mrs. Gray feels, feels the headboard for her glasses as the last of the trilobites dives beneath her denture water, goes through the floor, and dips ten feet through dirt to rest in stone. And I like, I, I like words that you don't see too often, like uh, bryozoan and arachnid. And so part of my rationale for writing this was writing about Maryville, this small town in northwest Missouri, and yet having uh, words like bryozoan and brachiopod and trilobites, uh, and, and they're there, they're underneath the, uh, they're in the rock underneath Maryville. Um, I also uh, have this line in here about their, these prehistoric creatures are uninventing legs and unremembering us. Um, I got that idea for using the word unremembering as a as an active verb, there's a poem, I think it's by Wordsworth, where he says something is unremembered, and he's just talking about things in the past. But what about the act of unremembering something instead of just forgetting it? I just thought it would be great to use, use that as a word, like it's an action rather than a state. And so there's where we got unremembering. Um, I'll read, um, I think I'll read two more poems. Uh, that I wrote uh, for grown-ups, and then I'll talk more about my children's books again. This is called Ev Pangborn's Bridge, and uh, it's about, a f uh, there's a, br I have a friend in Maryville, she doesn't live there anymore. Uh, she lived out in the country, and you had to cross this bridge to get to uh, the farm. Her parents, not a farm, but a um, a house out in the country, uh, a rattly old bridge, and I uh, one time uh, went over that bridge on a very uh, bright starlit uh, night and uh, started thinking of s some ideas as I was going over that bridge. So I, uh, I call it Ev Pangborn's Bridge. There is a definite moment when the night pulls from that tree into the next. One reason the woman smelling the field of fescue might be amazed because the night does roll like a hawk's shadow around the globe. The oak, therefore, owns a moment of equilibrium when the dying sheen of its leaves 
equals exactly the press of the coming dark. This means that when a man lets his shadow convene at the right moment with the falling of dark from the fescue spikelets, the night lurches forward to obtain a grain of soil second sooner, spilling its dark onto it. One night my whole life paused as I listened on Ev Pangborn's bridge, feeling some immense dark center pass overhead. And then uh, one more poem. This is a dramatic uh, monologue by a guy who's been visited by UFOs. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've also been interested in, when I, when I was growing up, I was interested in uh, old people in town that were kind of, uh, and out in the country that maybe had some unusual ideas and experiences to talk about. And, and I've always been interested since childhood in, in kind of vanishing personal history and uh, so I, even now, like I've recently been up to north, uh, northern Minnesota recording this old fiddler who uh, knows probably 25, 30 songs that would be, f they're about to be forgotten because he's 89 years old. And so I, I've uh, uh, written a lot about old people that have some, ra ranging from people that have his, uh, kind of important history that might be forgotten to s people that might have some off-the-wall ideas. And so this is actually not based on anybody real. Um, I just had the idea that there was this guy that was visited by UFOs, and he kind of turned his house into a shrine, like he put up uh, models of everything that happened around the house and around the yard. So here it is, uh, called Blessed by Meteors and by the Benevolent Men of Space. I woke, left my bed, stood right here, where I've marked the spot for grandchildren. Toes snug in carpet, I saw the kitchen flare with wavering light. Saw the colander humped up to dry, saw the note board, could almost read my notes, all from the light of a meteor lodged in the floor. To have your roof struck once makes a house and you seem small. Struck twice, you're blessed. See that hole, the facsimile I made? Put one hand on it. Feel the hot and cold drive to the bone. It almost gives me the vertigo again. Once a month or so, ships come uh, with light that's not quite light, a drone. They land softly in the grove. They leave as gift the usual, alloys not possible on Earth, some dirt from Mars. I've seen them lolling above the church. Each time I pass, I touch the graves and get a tingling in my hand. It almost hurts. Here's a model of their ship, a diorama of the time they stole the laundry off my line. Here's a photo, bad I'll admit, of their light as seen from behind the shed. I learned from them the dizziness inside the tree, the rendezvous of cell to cell in the guts of birds, the ache within the crystal, a kind of life. This replicas of the flag they set outside the ship before they hypnotized the dogs, I lost. Three purebreds, collies, and a goat. I sleep now in the woods, among the fairy rings their landing leaves. There must be ten. You ought to sleep out there with me tonight. With what it does to you, the light, the spinning, you can spend a year in fourteen days. Feel the murmur of their radios, Feel the waves of static from their eyes. They're listening. This all will be utopia soon. So that's what I was writing about uh, uh, at one time. And then I decided I was going to go back to my childhood uh, experiences and write children's books. And, um, and that's what eventually brought me to It's Disgusting and We Ate It. It's kind of a longer process than that. It, wasn't, it didn't happen overnight. I didn't actually um, ever stop writing poetry for adults either. Um, but I kind of am more focused now on writing books for children. And um, I had this idea to write a book of poems about unusual foods from around the world and throughout history. And the idea of the title came to me right away. It's disgusting, and we ate it. And so I wrote a few poems on foods that I already knew about. And I, I had this idea without knowledge at first. It was not like I was an expert on foods from around the world. I just remembered reading in National Geographic about bird's nest soup. And I remembered uh, reading about earthworms, uh, the giant earthworms that uh, were once eaten in New Zealand. So I wrote a couple of poems based on those two things. And then I thought, wow, that was interesting. Now I'll do some research. And I did. I started uh, looking up other 
foods from around the world, and I wrote poems about them. And I just had a little, maybe this much, if you see, maybe one or two sentences or maybe three sentences on the bottom of the page um, explaining what the poem was about. And I sent that to a few publishers and got a call from one of them. And this editor said, we want to publish this book, but we think that you should make it a nonfiction book with just poems interspersed throughout. And so could you please revise it and make it into a nonfiction book? Uh, and your deadline's one month from now. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, how about three months? And uh, I should have asked for even more than that, but I basically worked like crazy for three months trying to redo this book into a nonfiction book with, with, you know, with wacky approaches to foods around the world, um, ranging from lists of how different foods taste to um, foods that were uh, once considered to be uh, uh, dangerous or nasty in uh, various parts of the world or even in parts of the world today. Uh, I have a, a quote from Shakespeare <laughs> in here that has to do with, with eating uh, um, unusual things. It's a quote from King Lear uh, that I, I might read it to you in a minute, but uh, what I wanted to say was um, I, I called people all around the world, talked to friends that had moved to America from uh, places like New Zealand and Fiji and Italy and India and China. And after three months, I had kind of basically this, this new version of the book put together and sent it in to the publishers. Um, but when I got the uh, page proofs or galleys back about three months after that, I just thought, boy, I really needed to work on this some more. I was not happy with it. Um, and I was worried at that point, thinking, wow, am I really going to have a chance to revise it again? But luckily, um, the publishing process is a continuation of the writing process. And so my editors had lots of suggested changes for me. And so I was able to end up doing research for two years to write the book. Um, so I didn't need to worry about it at all. It turned out to be a lot different from what I had originally sent, and it turned out to be a lot different from what I sent in after three months. Um, in fact, um, one thing that happened was they got a new assistant editor partway through the process, and she had a great idea to reorganize the whole book. And so that was after they, they thought it was finished, but I still was uneasy about some things in here. And um, so, I thought I took that as a great opportunity to do more research and put more stuff into it. And what I found out was that the world has more strange foods than it could ever fit into a book like this. I ended up removing about just as much as is in here. So basically, this is half the material that I actually came up with. And after I wrote the book, of course, I go around talking about the book to schools and so forth. And somebody always volunteers that they know about some crazy food, and I go, I wish I would have put that in the book. <laughs> uh, but I, I was really pleased with how it turned out. Another thing about the process of publishing a book like this is that in the children's book world, the editors choose the illustrator. They don't ask for your advice or your input or anything. Um, so the, the process with this book was, uh, we want to publish your book. Our vision of it is totally different from what you actually did here, but we do want you to revise it and let us publish it. And we have a great illustrator picked out. Uh, he hasn't ever illustrated any books before, but we know he's really good. <laughs> so, so on day one of starting to, to rework this book, A, they wanted me to write a different book than the one I'd sent them, and B, the, their illustrator w was somebody I couldn't even find out what his style was like. But the, the other great thing that happened was uh, it allowed him to do a couple more books before mine because the, the writing process took so long with my book when they especially delayed it with this uh, new assistant editor. That gave him some extra time to do a couple more books. And by the time he was on my book, he had developed his mature style, you might say. <laughs> And so I was really pleased with the rough sketches when I saw the book. I knew that it was going to be a fantastic book. 
uh, visually. And when I saw the colors, it was even better than I expected. So I'm so pleased with the process and how it worked out uh, with that book. And then when this book came along and I sent it in, um, I got a call saying that they wanted to publish it. And, um, well, what do you know? Their vision for the book wasn't, for, wasn't to publish the book that I had actually sent them, but something that had that content but had a different approach. And so they wanted me to completely, they, they, uh, they wanted me to approach it from a completely different angle. And uh, they had an illustrator in mind. Or no, they didn't have one at that point. They, they hadn't chosen the illustrator yet. But once again, when I saw the rough sketches, I knew that, uh, that I was going to be pleased with the book. And again, both of my books have colors that are, they seem brighter than another children's picture books. And uh, I don't know if, uh, why that is, but my, uh, my books just seem to be so colorful thanks to those illustrators. And... Um, I don't know why that is. I hope it keeps up. But in both cases, I had nothing to do with the illustrators. And yet, when the books were done, I knew that the editors had chosen just the right person to do those books. And um, here's what happened with this one. It's, uh, it's nonfiction, Santa's Secrets Revealed, about how Santa can fly around the world in one night and how uh, reindeer can fly and all those important facts. I had it presented as uh, just a tour of Santa's facilities, and, and a kind of a sarcastic elf was, was leading the re reader through Santa's facilities. Mm -hmm. And my editor said, well, could you please make it into a story where there's a child having an adventure, and he gets to find out all of Santa's uh, inner workings of his kingdom. And, well... Um, I've uh, had such good experiences with editors' great ideas before that I wasn't too worried about it, but I wasn't sure if I thought that was necessary. But I went ahead and started trying working it into a story. So there's a boy named Stevie in here who doesn't believe in Santa Claus, and then Santa shows up in his room to uh, prove that, he, that Santa really is real. And uh, once I wrote the story and I compared the two versions, um, I thought, thank goodness for these editors, because it, there was nothing wrong with my previous version of the book, but this one was so much better. It had all the same facts about Santa and how he can do his magical things, and yet it had a story, too. And the story ties it all together and makes it more fun. And, and a, lot of the f a lot of the funniest things in the book, I think, actually um, came about because I put it into a story and they were not there in the original version. And some of the things that I took out were probably not as funny or interesting as what I put in. Um, Stevie's a more interesting uh, character than this uh, sarcastic elf that was leading the, <laughs> leading the tour originally. So I'll, I'll read part of this to you. Um, it's longer than most picture books, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. I might skip around and, and read parts of it. So here's Stevie on the first page. And he says, it's narrated by Stevie, You're probably wondering about this Santa guy. Who is he, and how does he keep track of billions of children around the world? Well, I've got the answer to almost any question you can ask about him. That's because I met Mr. Claus, and he told me his biggest secrets. Last year, I quit believing in Santa. I noticed their chimney was too skinny for even a chicken to slide down. So when a TV reporter asked me on Christmas Eve if I was watching for Santa, I said, Are you kidding? Do you really think a 1,700-year-old saint on a flying sleigh brings gifts to everyone on Earth all in one night, and he's got elves on the payroll? That night, I heard a voice in the dark. Ho, ho, ho! Pretending to snore doesn't fool me, Stevie. The song has it right. I do know when you're sleeping and when you're awake. Then the lamp clicked on. Beside my bed stood a guy who looked like a giant maraschino cherry with whiskers. Dad, I said, just because you got yourself a Santa suit doesn't mean you have to wake me up. 
How about leaving the gifts by the tree instead? I reached up to give his beard a yank, but then I noticed, uh, well, an elf at the foot of my bed. We saw you on TV, the elf said. What a shame, calling Mr. Claus a fake. But if you go on the late news and say you do believe in Santa, we'll forget about that. We'll even overlook these infractions. And the elf holds up a list that twirls over under the next page. <laughs> And it's a list of the things, the naughty things that Stevie has done in, the, in that year. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that is um, I wrote this part of the list, and I assumed that the illustrator would just make the list go on and have like squiggles the rest of the way. But the, the illustrator put actual words throughout the whole length of the list, and you, you have to get a magnifying glass to see some of them. But it's real words, and his things are really funny. I was, when I saw that, I was worried because I thought, uh-oh, he's put some of his own stuff in there, and I never got a chance to critique it or anything, but it's great. And so um, it starts out, some of the things on the list, it starts with uh, infraction number 9,734. Didn't say thank you for scra scratchy sweater from Aunt Mabel, 9735. Called school lunches, leftover biology experiments. 9736, ate des dessert before veggies. The next one is, wouldn't stay on own side of imaginary line in back seat. Um, let's see, I'll skip down to, uh, gave teacher an excuse note signed, my mom. <laughs> and that, my, uh, uh, my stepmother's a school principal, and she actually got an excuse note from a kid one time. Uh, Please excuse Johnny, signed, my mom. <laughs> Uh, so, and anyway, let's see if I can even read some of the ones that the illustrator put in here. Um, <coughs> tried to sell house on online auction. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, said that school orchestra sounded like uh, screeching weasels. <laughs> So he did, the illustrator did a great job. So Stevie gets to, uh, Stevie runs outside with Santa Claus, and in his backyard is Santa's sleigh. And Santa uh, calls out, Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, on Harry W. Throckmorton. Uh, there's a cow leading the sleigh that night because Rudolph was homesick. <laughs> and... Um, so there's, uh, oh yeah, so it, it says here, I looked at the so-called Santa. Where's your star reindeer? And Santa says, he's home recovering from bad fruitcake. Harry W. Throckmorton, the dancing Holstein, was all they had left at the agency. <laughs> and I thought this was a great illustration here. The world is uh, sideways, and the, the sleigh and the reindeer take off in a swirl up into the sky. So... You know, even the format of the book is important. It was that when they decided to do the book in the, uh, this format with a wide and short page, it allowed the illustrator to do these great panoramic uh, views of Santa's uh, sleigh and the North Pole and so forth. So they, uh, um, they go to... Uh, one of the first places they go is... Uh, uh, this place here, Stevie says, um, or Santa says, here we are, and then Stevie asks, at the North Pole? And Santa says, no, Cleveland, come on, let's see what our spy satellites are picking up. So this is uh, uh, hidden in a factory building or a warehouse in Cleveland. That's where Santa keeps his spy headquarters. And then here's the uh, control room in Cleveland. And... Um, it says, Santa showed me how to check any kid's naughtiness record on the computers. He even typed in my little sister's coordinates so we could aim a spy satellite at her. She was being good as usual. <laughs> um, and then when they're in there uh, looking at the kids uh, on the computer monitors, suddenly uh, the computers start to overload as 
all the screens fill up with pictures of Stevie saying he does not believe, because of course that was on national television, and so now it's creating a worldwide naughtiness crisis. <laughs> and so Santa has to bring Stevie out uh, to the North Pole pronto to get Stevie to believe, and then he has to go back on TV and uh, issue a retraction to uh, solve this worldwide naughtiness crisis that's happening. And um, there's what the North Pole looks like. I thought the illustrator did a great job on that. Um, in here is uh, where they uh, work on the anti-gravity science to help reindeer fly. Some elves here are floating around in the Reindeer Propulsion Laboratory. <laughs> they have anti-gravity collars that they're using as belts on this page. And um, I'll read this page, or I'll read part of this page to you. Um, inside, dozens of elf scientists floated around the room. They're flying like your reindeer, but how, I asked. Anti-gravity collars, Santa said. We're testing our new model. I grabbed a collar and shot to the ceiling. Surprised, I let go and started to fall. Just then, a furry flash scooped me out of the air. It was a reindeer wearing a blindfold. Don't worry, Santa laughed. George has radar. Radar? You mean you're getting rid of... No, no, Santa smiled. With radar and light, we'll have the safest sleigh in the sky. So, uh, and then there, there's an explanation on the next page about how uh, reindeer's noses can glow red. It says, reindeer radar begins with the insertion, or actually, it's, uh, it's an explanation of, of reindeer radar, and it implies something about how noses can also glow red. Reindeer radar begins with the insertion of firefly DNA into the genome to produce bioluminescence. Lowering the wavelength turns the light waves into microwaves that are amplified by electric eel implants. These waves bounce off obstacles and return to be collected by the antlers. <laughs> So this is George the Radar Reindeer, who's going to be helping uh, Rudolph on cloudy nights in the future. And uh, of course, if reindeer can give off radar, then they can give off light as well. So Stevie's a little bit hard to convince, though. So um, um, Santa decides to call in Mrs. Santa on this page. He's on the phone to Mrs. Santa. And then, then we get Mrs. Santa on the next page. Mrs. Claus didn't look at all like her publicity pictures. <laughs> Old Santa isn't too good with science, she said. He flies around having all the fun while I do the work. Oh, you're the rocket scientist, dear, not me, Santa blushed. I'm but a simple saint traveling the world and bringing joy to billions. So Mrs. Santa is actually a uh, rocket scientist and a theoretical physicist. <laughs> And she designed the space-time scruncher that allows Santa to go around the world in one night. And uh, uh, up here I have an explanation of uh, how relativity ties into um, Santa being able to go around the world in one night. Um, so I think this is the only children's picture book with the theory of relativity in it. <laughs> um, I might as well read the, uh, the page about how how the sleigh can get around the world in one night. The space-time scruncher first compresses space-time like a mouth scrunching a big burrito. Then it releases a giant quantum burp that blasts a hole to the past. The sleigh then skips back in time according to Gödel's last wild guess, pi ug equals yek 4 pu, which states that the energy of a spinning black hole equals that of one bean burrito from Arnie's House of Tacos. Finally, space-time spits the sleigh out like a bad jalapeno, and the sleigh arrives at the next house minutes before it left the previous house. And then that ties in with the end of the story, because uh, after they go around, Stevie goes all around the world with Santa Claus, and then they use the space-time scruncher to skip back in time so he can go on TV and issue a retraction in time to prevent the... Um, uh, the worldwide naughtiness crisis from happening. <laughs> and, uh, and so all that stuff that has to do with Stevie and, um, and the worldwide naughtiness crisis, that's all stuff that I put in there thanks to my editor asking me to 
have more of a story in the book. And I'm so glad that I did because um, I like that stuff maybe more than a lot of the other stuff that I put into the book. So I guess the, the moral of the story with me is that no matter how good a job I think I've done on a book, there's always some other perspective that I can take that it can make it much better than I had ever imagined. And uh, I try to uh, write and revise and revise until I think I have something that is fantastic. But no matter how good it is, it seems that there's always some way to, to make it better in some, some way. And so um, I owe a lot to my editors and um, people that have uh, just given me advice about uh, my writing. And I write a, um, <clears throat> even though I'm focusing mostly on children's books now, I write um, young, I'm writing a young adult novel set in 13th century Norway. Um, I'm writing a middle grade novel, or I actually have finished drafts of both of them, and I'm putting finishing touches on to send to editors. And I'll be really interested in seeing what they have to say because this novel, for example, I can't imagine that there's a different way to, <laughs> to see it that's going to require a total revision and a totally new approach. It just seems like it's a, uh, it's a novel with a lot of interesting things going on it, and I, I don't see how I could do that drastic of a revision, but we'll soon find out. <laughs>